the exaltation of Christ. Jesus has been crowned with glory and honor. Hebrews 2.9 That the eternal Son of God should sit upon the throne of power presents no difficulty to regenerate minds, but that one in our nature should be exalted to the seat of preeminence is a mystery presented to faith's acceptance. How transcendently amazing that those hands which once were nailed to the cross should now hold the scepter of universal dominion, that those feet which were once weary and dust soiled at Jacob's well, which were washed with a sinful woman's tears and kissed in penitential grief and love with polluted lips, should now have all things both in heaven and in earth, Ephesians 1, 21 and 22, put under them. Yet how blessed to know that that lowly, gentle, compassionate Savior who can be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, is possessed of all authority and might, supreme majesty and government, so that he can answer his people's prayers, deliver them from their enemies, support them under their trials, and at last take them to be with himself forever. During the days of his humiliation, A veil was drawn over the Savior's glory, yet some rays occasionally broke through, manifesting to attentive spectators His essential and official dignity. The perfect life which He lived, the heavenly doctrine which He taught, the amazing miracles which He performed, proclaimed Him to be none other than the only begotten Son of God and the promised Redeemer of Israel. At his birth, the angels heralded him as Christ the Lord, Luke 2.11. At his baptism, they opened heavens, the voice of the Father and the descent of the Spirit upon him in the form of a dove, gave witness that he was more than man. The dark scene of his death was illuminated by supernatural phenomena to signify that he was no ordinary sufferer. Even his burial was not without honor, for though he had been put to death in the most ignominious manner and under the imputation of the greatest of crimes, yet his body was wrapped in fine linen and precious spices by men of high rank and deposited in a new sepulchre. However, the circumstances mentioned gave only a partial relief to the deep gloom of self-abasement which had rested upon Christ for thirty-three years. His life, from the manger to the tomb, was via a path of shame and sorrow. It was not until His resurrection that the glory which was to follow his sufferings began to shine forth in unmistakable splendor. Then it was that the character of Christ was vindicated from the aspersions of his enemies. Then it was that the Father openly testified to the Mediator's accomplishment of that work which had been given him to perform. Then it was that the Lord Jesus obtained eternal redemption for his people, and by rising as their representative, gave pledge that they too should rise after his example and through his merits and power. Having finished the work which had been assigned him by the Father, it was not necessary for the Mediator to prolong his stay upon earth, Rather, was it expedient that he should leave it in order to enter into his well-earned reward, that he should perform those benevolent offices by which the benefits of his humiliation and death should be communicated to his people. 
and in particular to make way for the coming of another divine person, not in visible form, but in a powerful dispensation of life and light, holiness and consolation. But now I go my way to him that sent me, and none of you asketh me whether goest thou, but because I have said these things unto you, sorrow hath filled your heart. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is expedient for you that I go away, for if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. John 15, 5-7 Accordingly, we read that after he had given all necessary instructions to his disciples, Christ was parted from them and received up into heaven. Luke 24, 51 John Dick said, Our Lord ascended in human nature. The man Christ Jesus has left the earth and entered into that invisible region of the universe where God sits on the throne of His majesty. To His followers, it is a source of high consolation to know that He has not laid aside their nature, but retained it amidst His glory, because they can look up to Him with confidence in the full assurance of His sympathy and see in His exaltation an earnest of their future glory. As God, He could neither descend or ascend, because His divine essence, filling heaven and earth, cannot change its place and does not admit of that exaltation or that accession of glory which the ascension implies. It was in His assumed nature that He who had first descended after ascended, that He might fill all things, heaven with His glory, and the earth with the blessings of His grace. Unquote. At His ascension, the Mediator was attended by the heavenly hierarchies, although invisible to human eyes. The chariots of God are twenty thousand, thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai, in the holy place. Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive, thou hast received gifts for men. Psalm 68, 17 and 18. The angelic hosts celebrated Christ's mighty achievements and attested the high dignity of the victor, who is gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. 1 Peter 3.22 Therefore did they come on the occasion of his ascending to do homage to their Lord and to swell his train when he took possession of his kingdom. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Ephesians 4.8 Leading captivity is clearly interpreted for us in Judges 5.12, where an ancient custom long observed and well known in the times of the apostles is in view. When a victorious general returned home in public triumph, the captives he had taken were led in chains before him, and the richest of the spoils adorned his chariot. Borrowing a figure of speech from this established practice, the apostle pictures our mediator as the conqueror of sin, Satan, the world, death, and every spiritual enemy of himself and his people. He had spoiled principalities and powers by releasing many of their victims and now made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Colossians 2.15 Compare also Luke 
21 and 22, and Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. The expression, captivity captive, is a putting of the abstract for the concrete. Captivity for captives, and that for the purpose of emphasizing the fact that his elect should be freed from their captor, the devil. From what has just been said, the hearer will know that we do not endorse the strange theory which some have advanced, namely, that the souls of the Old Testament saints were outside of heaven before Christ's resurrection, and that not until his ascension were they conducted on high. Hebrews 11.40 at once disposes of such a view. No, we regard Ephesians 4.8 as referring to the Mediator's triumph over the infernal powers. Again, John Dick said, They who made men captives by their successful stratagems saw the spoils wrested from their hands and were themselves made captive by our Almighty Redeemer. Whether they were compelled to be present and were exhibited as vanquished foes, disgraced and ruined, and reserved to everlasting punishment, we are not warranted by a single expression of which no explanation is given to affirm. Mr. Pink personally believes Colossians 2.15 justifies this conclusion. But there is no doubt that our Savior triumphed over them while he ascended, that in his exaltation to the throne of heaven they beheld a fearful presage of the final overthrow of their kingdom. Unquote. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. Mark 16.19 It ought not to be necessary for us to point out that such language as this is figurative. Yet, in this day of carnalizing spiritual things, it may be well to supply a word of explanation. Neither the right hand of God nor the posture ascribed to our Savior can be literally understood. God is pure spirit, John 4.24, and has no bodily members. When mention is made of his eyes, ears, feet, hands, we must explain them consistently with the spirituality of his essence and regard them as metaphors employed to assist us in conceiving his perfections and operations. Although the Mediator, in his exaltation, has a material body, yet his sitting is as figurative as the right hand of God. In Acts 7.55, he is pictured as standing, and in Revelation 2.1, as he who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. The right hand is the place of honor. Genesis 48, 14, 1 Kings 2, 19, and Psalm 80, 17. Christ's being seated at God's right hand is expressive of his exaltation, of the glory which has been conferred upon him of his official dignity. It also denotes the possession of supreme happiness, Psalm 1611, and of invincible might, Matthew 26.64. It is God's answer to the prayer of his incarnate Son. And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. John 17, 5 The humanity of Christ has been elevated high above all creatures. He is the firstborn 
entitled to the double portion among many brethren. Romans 8.29 Angels adore Him, and the saints will cast their crowns before His throne. All heaven will yet cry, Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Revelation 5.12 In the meantime, it is ours to love, serve, and worship Him with all our hearts and to count upon Him for the supply of our every need. Arthur Pink